mother of Shimshon, the mother of Shimshon. In the chapter, she's just called Eshet Manoach. But in Divrei Hayamim, we have a name. She's called the Tzilponit, as being the sister from the tribe of Dan. So Chazal say, oh, this must be the same person. So it's done a whole bunch of times in the Mikra. So here we have in, in Perig Vav and Perig Zion, we have a woman who comes onto the Teva who is unnamed. And here we have a woman who is named, but we know no information about them. So Chazal, therefore, <laughs> uh, we'll see that in a minute. But what is important, by the way, is let's point in, Nama comes from which family line? She comes from Cain, who is the cursed family line. Where is Noah coming from? Noah comes from Shait, which is the good family line. Okay, so we have a mixed uh, shidduch here. Okay, between the blessed as opposed to the cursed. Now, let's try to see if we can understand a little bit more about Naama and what the family that she's born into. So the first thing we pointed out is that her father's name is Lemech. And Lemech did something unusual, apparently, is that he married two women. Now, turn to source number six. In source number six, Rashi tells us, two wives. So was the custom of the generation of the flood. So yes. It's not only Lemech, but it maybe he was the one who thought of the concept. I don't know, but apparently they all did it. Now listen, one wife was for propagation and one for marital relations. And the one who was for marital relations would be given a potion of roots to drink so that she would become sterile. But the other one, he would adorn her like a bride and feed her delicacies. But her companion was neglected and mourning like a widow. Now let's talk about this family dynamic for a minute. Okay, we've got one wife who I guess today we call her the trophy wife, mm -hmm. the plaything, literally, and she's fed delicacies and she gets jewelries and she's, you know, the one of interest to the husband. And the other one is there literally just as a womb. You know, her job is strictly to have children. Nobody really cares about her. Nobody's interested in her. You know, like, almost like you hear, like, mourning like a widow. Um, now, what does that tell you about Lemech, that he takes two women like that? What does that tell you about him? What's, what's he thinking? Lucky me. Lucky me. That's right. It's very, egoistic. It's very egotistical. It's what, what's great for me. I want to have children. You know, children are important. But at the same time, I also want to have fun. So this way I get two and I get both. And, you know, it's a win-win for him. It's a win-win for him. But then we sort of have to ask ourselves, like, what would the dynamic look like in the house between these two women? Okay, a hundred, a hundred percent that this is part it's not the only reason, but this is 100% part of the degradation of the society in that um, there is a certainly, it's abuse, it is abusive. There's no question about that there's abusive of women and that it's all about, you know, me, what's good in it for me. And we will notice, by the way, and we'll talk about this more. I think that the Shoshima, the problem definitely is yeah, both. Is here often the two wives. The, the only one never okay, so wives. let's talk about this for a second. One second. Let's talk about this for a second. There is something very different about Lemech's two wives mm -hmm. and Avraham's two wives. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Because she was better. It wasn't, a, it wasn't the first thing like, let's take two wives. It's let's take one wife. She doesn't have children. So now we have a problem that we need to be solved. But look at all the problems that were. Right. Listen, but I love to tell the story. One of my favorite stories is when I was a young teacher. I was talking, teaching the story of Sagar, Sarah and Hagar in a high school class in New York. Brooklyn? Not Brooklyn, uh, central Manhattan. And one of the girls in the class raised her hand and said, I don't understand why Torah would allow two wives. It's only asking for trouble. 
And a kid in the back of the room is, you know, raising a hand, raising a hand. And I call on her and she says like this, my grandfather has two wives and they're very happy. <laughs> and she starts explaining her father was Yemenite, her grandfather was Yemenite. Now remember, I'm talking about the 1980s. So this was not that long ago that she still had a grandfather who had come to Israel with two wives. And she was describing how happy the family dynamic was. <laughs> Yeah, we're so used to all, you know, you all that stuff is about everything. You always hear the bad stories, you know, about trips or what have you know. Well, whatever. In my head. Okay. Anyway, anyway, let's, but we understand, let's, what I'm trying to point out here about Lemech is his, his desire to marry two women was not out of need. It wasn't out of necess necessity. It was out of lust. It was out of what's in it for me. Now, let's just take a look. In continuing in that Rashi in source six, let's see who, which wife was which job. Ada, she was the, I guess what we call the Miss Kena. She was the one who was there for propagation. And what does her name show? Her name comes from the Aramaic translation of Sura to turn away. You know, really, literally using her. And who's the plaything. The plaything is a woman named Sila. He shall Tashmish. And why is she called Sila? Because she was the one who would always sit in his shade. And these are the words of the Agadah. So people call their names Ada and Sila today. Uh, they're not familiar with the, yeah, you know, they think it's a nice name, whatever it is. Now, well, to, again, there again, that was at a, that was a different situation, and we are going to come back to that eventually because we're going to talk about one of our conversations are going to be Bill and Zilpa when we get down to those chapters. Okay, now let's go back, by the way, and look at those psukim in Breshi chapter four. What do you notice about the names of the two sons? What does that remind you of? The name Yaval. Yuval, what letters do you see there? It's from modern day Yuval, but who other's name? What other name do you hear hidden in that name? Hevel. Hevel. Wait a minute. Hevel, this is the, these are the generations of Cain. And who are they naming the children after? Hevel. And wait a minute, what's that? For, what's Yuval's job? What's Yuval's job? He's a, before the, that's Yuval. Yav. Yavo, the first one. What's his name? What's his job? He is a Yoshev Ohel Umikne. What is he? He's a shepherd. Who was a shepherd? Havel, right? Because he brings from. So you begin to see that already in the story we have like references to Havel, and we sort of want to wonder about that. And there's a relationship between the seventh generation and being able that the ground will grow. It, it is, we'll see that in a minute, that there is a certain amount of, by the seventh generation, they start producing. Mm -hmm. That's correct. You'll notice also, by the way, that the other brother, Yuval, he is a musician. Now, what do you know about music? And I think this is an important point for here. First of all, um, the connection between shepherd and music, where do you recognize it from? You recognize it from David. Now, also, what else was David? Besides being a musician, besides being a shepherd, he was also a warrior, warrior which brings us to the third brother, whose name, by the way, is Tuvel Kayin. Mm -hmm. Tuvel Kayin. Why does he name him? And what does he do? What's his job? Let's talk about this method. What's Tuvel Kayin's job? He's making metal. Now, what's the problem with metal working? It could be done. Metal work can go, it could be God for good and bad. And he'll just take, let's just quote the Pasuk uh, from Ishayo that sits on the United Nations of all places, right? And they will cut their they will cut their weapons into plowsheds. That same metal can be plowsheds and can be. Yeah. So the question is when when Tuval Kayan is um, making this copper and iron, is he for good or for bid. Now, one more thing I want to point out in these psukim is notice what, what does Lemech do? One second, in verse 23. I don't have time to get into this, but let's just throw it out there. What does he do? Lemech. Lemech is our second person in world history who kills another person. 
And he said, who did he kill? Rashi there tells us who did he kill. According to the Medrash, he actually kills Cain. The, the way the Medrash tells the story, I'll just throw this out quickly, is Tubal Cain was hard of, see, he couldn't see very well. And remember, there's this Medrash that uh, Cain had a horn. He sees the horn. He thinks it's an animal. He shoots his arrow. He kills Cain. His wife say to him, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And then he says that little song there as well. But now, what's the question? What? There was, he was a grandson who was coming. Apparently, he was, since he was blind, he had a grandson who was taking with him. And when he realized he had killed his grandfather, he got so upset that he killed the grandson as well. It's a whole story there. Okay, one second. I just told you that Lemach takes two wives. One to have children and one to be the trophy wife. But it doesn't work so well, right? The second, who's the, who's the trophy wife? Sila. And what does Sila have? Two children. She has a son, Tuvel Kayed, and she has a daughter, Naama. Now, the first question I ask myself, and again, nobody says this, is how does Lemech treat these children that are accidents? No, really, I don't know what else to call them, right? Yes, yes, we do assume that we do assume that they're twins, and I'll show you why in a minute. But still, I'm like wondering again how that time family dynamic works when this wife who's not supposed to have any children all of a sudden has. How do you treat her? Right? How do you treat her? How do you treat those children? That's a question to just throw out there as well. Anyway, Sila, Sila, she's the trophy wife. She's the toy. That's right. She's the plaything. Now, what do you notice, by the way, about verse 22? Also, let's talk about the syntax of that verse. What do you notice? I think it's strange, first of all, by the fact that we have mention of Naama. Why is she mentioned, first of all? And we also have, look at this. Yaval is a shepherd. Yuval is a musician. Tuval Kayin is a metal worker. And Nama. Wife who might be the wife, no, but who right, but it doesn't fit into this syntax of of these verses. What is she doing there? Because when you said because women didn't work, that was a well-known thing. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look at Chizkuni on source number seven. Chizkuni tells us, and this is answering the question you asked. Chizkuni says, and it says, and his brother's name was Yuval. From the manner in which the Torah reports their birth, it's clear that they were twins as you picked up yourselves. If not, his birth would have been introduced with, and she gave birth also, etc. Now, he also mentions that it's customary for shepherds to entertain themselves by playing the flute or similar musical instruments. Most likely, Nama, Tuval Kayan's sister, born of Tzila, was also a twin, and Tzila is not credited with having given birth twice. But now you ask the question even, how is it that she's even giving birth at all? So look here in source number nine. Well, actually, we'll do eight and then nine. Eight, eight is the Siftecha Hamim, who explains Rashi, and says, she was given a portion that would make her barren so she would not lose her beauty. So you might ask, if so, why does it say that Sila gave birth? The answer is she gave birth before she drank the potion. Or I think then the second answer is better, which is more likely. Another answer, it says, Sila also gave birth to teach that even though she took the potion, we know that birth control only works, even in this day and age, it works only 98, 99% of the time. And so there too, she gave birth anyway, as the potion did not affect her. Ha ha, ha ha, Just go right on my, uh, right. Now look at source number nine. Source number nine asks the question that many of you have been asking. And that's how does Rashi know that this woman, Naama, is actually the wife of Noah? Like, why, why connect it? So you might ask, how did Rashi know this? So therefore, all of those of you who had the question, Siftei Chachamim had the same question. The answer is, she is called Naama because her deeds were pleasant from the word Naima, similar to Naomi in the book of Ruth, Noam, you all know people with names like that. And she behaved modestly. I don't know where he knows that from. But if so, why would she perish in the flood and not be saved like Noah was? Perforce, she was Noah's wife and thus saved from the flood. 
And says a little bit of logic like this, you know, a little backward logic. Okay, how do we know that she's Noah? Well, she, the wife of Noah was saved. If the wife of Noah was saved, she must have been righteous. If she must have been righteous, then, oh, well, look at this. Here we have a righteous woman named Nima, so it must be her. Now listen to the another proof Rashi gets. Listen to this one. Another answer, Rashi's proof is the fact that this woman is mentioned where other women were not. By the fact that she's mentioned, it has to be significant. And why is this? Because Naama had three brothers, Yaval, Yuval, Tuval, Kayin. And Tuval Kayin was wicked, as Rashi previously explained that he produced weapons for murderers. But Yaval was righteous, dwelling in tents, according to Rashi's first explanation. Also, Yuval was righteous. So therefore, two brothers were righteous and one was wicked. Did everybody get that? Mm -hmm. She's got two half brothers, one full brother. Two of them are wicked. One, two of them are righteous. One of them is wicked. And look at this. Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Shem and Yafet were righteous, as Rashi explains in Parshat Noah. And Ham was wicked, as it's seen here. Now, so what do you think? She has two and one brothers. And we all know Torah always feels that if you want to check out a woman, you always have to look at her brother. And look at that. She has exactly like her brothers, two sons that are righteous and one that's wicked. So Sipte Chacham says, this is where Rashi gets the fact that she must have been Noah's wife. No, I think it's a little bit similar to that thing is how do we know that Yaakov wore a black hat? <laughs> Because it says that Yaakov went out. Would he go out without his hat? You know, I, I think it's a little bit like that. Like you make the dots and then draw. Right, that the picture. But here it seems to be that, and we're going to see that there really is a well-known uh, Misora that this Naama is Noah's wife. But before we get to that, I want to ask, does Naama have a profession? The other threes have profession. Now you right away told me, oh no, women don't. Yes. Yeah. Gary. Aye, aye. I'm listening. Are you talking? No, okay. Okay, so first of all, let's look in source number 10. Uh -huh. The Zohar. Actually, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Why were the two righteous brothers not saved from the flood? As Yuval and Yuval, why weren't they saved? That's a very good question. Maybe they were dead by the time that the flood came around. They were dead. They didn't live that long. It doesn't say that they were killed in the Mabul. But now let's look at source number 10. Source number 10 asks the question that we're dealing with. Rabbi Yitzchak says, why it's written and the sister of Tuval Kain was Nama. Well, Rabbi Yitzchak says she was a righteous woman and pleasing in her deeds. Right, we've seen this already a number of times. Rabbi Abahu says, the simple sense of the scripture indicates that she was learned in metalworking like her brother Tuval Kayin, as implied that it's written. He was the progenitor of every implement of bronze and iron and the sister of Tuval Kayin, Nama. He invented the craft and his sister was with him, as it's written, and the sister of Tuval Kayin, Nama. She was skilled like him. And the and and the sister joins the preceding statement. Right, so fascinating. It's fascinating because it's something so foreign to what we think about ancient times. And here the Zohar is coming along and saying that it mentions her because she was actually a partner to Tuval Kayan in his metal working uh, business. But how does the Zohar even know that? What? I mean, how does, how does the, Zohar, Zohar, the Zohar knows it based on the fact that it says, and you have a vav there in the Pasuk, Right? You have it the achot to Valkayin. Why would it you need the the achot? It would have been just it could have just been vegan yalda at to Valkayin, achot to Valkayin Nama. They say by the addition of the the indicates that she is a partner with syntax. With the syntax, come back to the syntax. He made the plows and he made the maybe, maybe that was an that's an interesting uh they said that everybody had their specialty. She was making the plowshares. She was making the weapons. I don't know, but it certainly opens up our mind to a, another personality. Also, why does the Zohar do it? Because everybody else here is mentioned with a job. And the fact that she's mentioned in the Zohar that she also must have had a job. But now, if we look in source number 11, we're going to see a different job. The Targum Yonatan says, oh no, Silva, Sila also 
had these children and the sister, I'm saying the second sentence, and the sister of Tuval Kain was Naama. She was mistress of elegies and song. So it's not according to Targum Yonatan, she wasn't a professional metal worker. What was she? She was a professional musician. musician. She was, a, now where does Targum Yonatan get that from? See the metal work I understood. Where does Targum Yonatan get the, the singing from? Because her name, how do we refer to King David? We refer to King David as Ni'im Zimirot Yisrael, Ni'im Na'ama, that the idea of song. Now we also know, by the way, that in ancient times, who was in charge of, you know, sing, saying the eulogies? You know, the women whose jobs it were were to go out and cry. cry. They were professional criers. They were professional mourners. And we do have them mentioned a number of times in the Mikra. And so here too, the idea is it's coming back to um, uh, Na'ama, that idea as well. Now, I want to point out also something else like, here we're talking, as you pointed out, we're in the seventh generation, and now we're talking about developing the world. Now, if any of your children came home and said to you, mom, dad, I'd really like to be a musician, many of you would say, well, that's really lovely, but get a master's. You know, you don't view musicians, right, that's a spare time, right? You do that in the evenings, get a real job. My mother said, young, there you go. Juilliard. Okay, there you go. So that, and that's how we, but you see, but what's interesting here is that the Psukim are talking about the development of the world. And one of the things that's important to the development of the world is music. That it is considered one of those fundamental steps in the development of the world. And I will very nice living for music, yes. Okay, and I just wanted to show you what is something I found in the Radak in source number 12, which I found so interesting. The Radak here, I'm gonna summarize it for lack of time, and I'm sorry I couldn't find it in English, but the Radak here tells us that God implants in every human being talents. And it takes time for those talents to come out and then you have a responsibility to identify those talents and develop them. And he says, that's what's happening here. You have the guy who's being drawn to shepherding and you have another guy who's being drawn to metal work. You have somebody else who's being drawn to music and that those are things that have implanted into everybody. And it's just a matter of, you know, developing them and bringing them out. I thought that was a very modern idea that we find in the Radak. But what this would tell us is that she has a, soul of what we would call a poet of a musician of something. Now, if you look at source number 13, source number 13 is academic work on, actually it's on Tehillim, but he is a biblical scholar, Nahum Sarna. And he says, the text records the birth of a daughter named Naamat Tulemech. No accomplishment is ascribed to her, but since it's rare for daughters to be mentioned in the genealogies of the book of Breshit, it may be assumed that she was the subject of a well-known legend. In other words, Torah doesn't have to tell you what she does because everybody knows, right? How Israeli is that? We don't have to tell you, everybody knows. An ancient Jewish tradition fills in the gap. It holds her to have been a professional singer of religious music. And this is of interest for two reasons. The underlying root of the name Naama in Arabic and Syriac, and in some Hebrew texts, means to sing. And the account also recognizes, and I thought this was so interesting, the great antiquity and the high prestige of vocal and instrumental music, which it regards as one of the most noteworthy achievements of the human race. Very, very interesting, right? Calms everybody down. Right, so that's a very interesting point. I'll accept that truth that she's going on to the Teva. Let's point out that too. If she's going on to the Teva, we assume that she's aiding Noah. How else could he feed all of those animals? And you're saying perhaps she's able to use the music as a calming uh, thing. That's what I said for everybody on the tent as well. Maybe we could connect the uh, music with uh, the metal work, which she used her skill as a magician. It could be. I'll accept that as well. And now, yes. Now look at source number 14. Source number 14 is the Abarbanel who throws a little bit, uh, get a wrench into our discussion. 
And the Abarbanel brings that business that we know about. So this seems to be, although we saw the metal work in the Zohar, it seems to be more the tradition is that she was this singer. She is the one who created uh, music, uh, vocal music. It seems that he would play the music and she would accompany him, right? Because music has two. There's the notes and then there's the vocal. And that was the combination between them. And maybe she had kola arev. She had a beautiful voice. Now listen. Ubebreshit Rabba, it says, shana mazo taita eshat noach. Right, that we've been discussing. Shenikrait kein mepnesha manase na'im. And then he says, umin ha nereh. He says, but it seems to me, she'ena ha'isha sholid mine mena noach banav. He said, she might have been the wife of noach, but she is not the mother of Shem Ham and Yafet. What forces a Barb and to say that? She'im haya kein haya mishtal shel ha'olam mizera kayin. Because remember, we said that she comes from Cain. And one of the major reasons of the Mabul was to wipe out the seed of Cain. But if she's the mother of Shem, Ham, and Yafet, that I don't care who, how, who else you're killing out, you've- uh, In Parshat Noah, late after the flood, we've criticized, there, the generations have criticized for mixing. So somebody survived and so some, so we'll, say, we'll get to that in a minute. And by the way, just skip, skip down to the list. So he, so he's, so a Barbanel is of the opinion, a Barbanel is of the opinion that Noah had a wife number one. She gave birth to Shem, Ham, and Yafet, and then he had wife number two, whose name is Nama, who went onto the boat. Now, what's he basing this on? Logic. He has no, right? Where, where He's, the first wife then? Right, we don't mention her. We don't know about her. But I want to show you the last sentence of the Abarbanel. She, she missed the boat. Look at the last sentence, by the way. It doesn't say that. One second, one second, let me get to it. Let's just look at the last line in the Abarbanel. The last line of the Abarbanel says, also, by the way, if you look at these names of the boys, similar to Hevel, why was he called Hevel? Because he was here today and gone tomorrow. All of those names, Yaval, Yuval, Tuval, and that perhaps answers the question we had. Lermoz, Shekulam, Yavol, Libiloi, Vahashchata, Bimabur. That the, the last line in the Abarbanel. You see it? That their names also indicate, you know, short lived uh, 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 existence. Okay, let's sort of sum up what do we know about Nama until this point in time. She seems to be a woman who's born into a complicated family situation. Let's call it that. She is a sister to talented brothers. She herself has some sort of talent. And her siblings have all been named for Hevel, short-lived, etc. And this causes us to basically say that as we said, we pointed out that if she is indeed saved, she is saved because of her righteousness. We pointed out earlier that why do they go onto the, and this compared to what we started with, she goes onto the ark with her husband, but separated from her husband. It's a sort of like holiness in order to, you know, counterbalance her parents. Perhaps you could say that as well. And another proof, by the way, that she is righteous is if you look in source number 17, again, I'm not going to read it inside, but here too, Rashi explains that everybody else in those generations had children when they were 100 years old. All of a sudden, Noah is having children when he's 500. Why? So he says here, Rashi, that he wanted to make, God wanted to make sure that Shem, Ham, and Yafet were still children. And in that way, first of all, they would not deserve to be punished because even if they were bad, they still haven't reached the age of punishment. Also, they don't have tons of other children because there's a limit to how much room there is on the... But what's important to me about that Rashi is Rashi specifically says that if you got on the Teva, you deserved to get on 
that table. And let's take a look at uh, source 19, by the way, is the Ramban. Again, I don't know what happened to it. It sort of disappeared. It is the Ramban in Breshit. You have it, you just don't have the word Ramban. I said that disappeared. Oh, you know what, before we do Ramban, well, this will be clearer. Look at 18, by the way, before we go further. Look at 18. I gave you the family line. Noah is the son of Lemech, the grandson of Metushalach. Naama is the daughter of Lemech, the granddaughter of Metushael. Now, you, when you read the Pesukim, you don't get that because you don't see it so close to each other. What does that say to you? Yeah. And by the way, no, he didn't marry his sister. We know that. There are two different Lemechs. Mm -hmm. There are two different Lemechs. Everybody clear? Remember, Noah is from Sheit. Naama is from Cain. And those of you who know that if you speak Sephardic Hebrew, Chet and Ayin are very, you know, they pronounce the Chet as a So if her name can not only be Naama, but her name could also be Nechama, which is really the female version of Noah. Which so again, I'm going to try to say is I think there is a mirror here of Noah to his wife. But now let's look at these. So if you want to add it in, it should be source 19. It's the Ramban on Breshit, chapter 4, verse 22. I'm going to go back. I only was able to find a little bit of an English. So let's look at the Hebrew. So the first thing he brings is what we're talking about, that it is a chot na'ama, second sentence. Breshit Rabban, yesh omrim ishto shel noach Again, as, as Nachum Cernas said, this was a very well-known legend. V'lam haya karim otel na'ama. And why did they call her Nama? Shaya maaseha naim vinaim. Her ways were pleasant. And it kavul omar shayala shame bedorot. And she must have been an extremely well known figure. Ki hiatat sadeket vaholidu tzadikim. She herself was righteous and she gave birth to righteous children who belonged to be named Ulachain Yiskarena Hakatuv. And the reason we, all of this, you have to assume it is because the fact that she is named the Imkain, and therefore, and against a Barbanel, look at this next sentence, nishar lekayin zecher ma'at ba'olam. And therefore, Kayin's genealogy was not completely wiped out, but there was actually a little bit of Kayin who stayed in this world. And now look at... <laughs> but now look at source, and here you're going to see something interesting. Look at source 21. Source 21 is a small piece from Rav Tzadok HaKohen Milublin. You've heard people talk about Rav Tzadok, and in his parsha, Parshat Vayelech, on Shabbos Shuva, that's the parsha that we read Shabbat Shuva, he says like this, the Chen Matzinu Bakayim, we also find Kayin, you all know that after he kills Hevel and God says to him all those terrible things that's going to happen to him, he turns to God and he says, Gidol Avoni Minaso, is my uh, sin too great to bear? And there's a machlok at Rashi Ramban. Do we read it with an exclamation point? Do we read it with a question mark? But whatever. So here, according to this proof that Kayin really did Shuvah, Naama ishtosha noah chaita viatsa minena kol haolam. He says this has to prove that he must have been okay because his descendant went onto the teva. All of life came out of her. Even Avram Avinu alef shalom v'chol uma hayisraelit. Right. So this that's what I mean. It goes against it goes against the barbanel, and not only does it go against right, it makes much more sense. And also, one second. But also it teaches us a tremendous lesson here. Naama, her brothers were bad, her society was bad, her everything that she knows, but yet she is somehow able to choose otherwise. No you know, and no Ahtu, but she even you can even say that she had the DNA, you know, to choose otherwise. And she is Naama, she's not Hevel, she's not Yuval, she's not Tuval, she is somebody different. And what it proves to us that despite the violent, oppressive nature of the society around her, 
And despite her difficult family makeup, she is able to choose differently. And she gets onto the Teva and she becomes the mother eventually of Am Yisrael as well. And of the rest of the world. We said this before with Lavan. Look at the girl with the Lavan. Right. We have other times where this comes as well. And listen, I think this is very um, pertinent. Wait a second. You never know anything about it. We're not finished though. Wait. Um, then, you know, today, especially in America, you know, if you are white, you are automatically a negative colonial oppressor. oppressor. <laughs> Yeah, just because of your skin color and nothing based on who you are. Uh, well, I was, I was, I was. Okay. okay, so this was all, everything that I presented to you was, is answer number one. However, but, but, let's go back to source 15. Source 15 is the Breshit Rabbah. And the first thing the Breshit Rabbah brings is what we fought till now, that Nama is the wife of Noah, and why was she called Nama? Sheyuma Seha Naim. Second line. The Rabbanan Amre, but Rabbanan tell us, Nama Acheretaita. No, no, no. There's the wife of Noah. Maybe she's named Nama, maybe she's not named Nama. That's not. This woman that we are mentioning here in Breshi chapter four is Nama Acheret. The Lama Hayu Korim Oto Naama. Why is she called Nama? Shahita Mina Emet, she would sing Bitov La Avodat Kohavim. All of a sudden, she would play music, but for idol worship. So that, wait a minute, she's not this Sadeket that we have been presenting until now, and that this woman is no different than the rest of. Right. Her siblings and the society that's around them. And one second, to make this even more complicated, go back into source 19, which is where we were in that Ramban that the name disappeared. If you look in the middle of the fourth line from the bottom, it says, Umedrash Acher. You see in the middle of the line? Okay. Umedrash Acher. He says, by the way, he, remember he had just said till now that Nama was a tzaddiket and everybody knew about it, whatever. whatever. But he says, I want you to know that there's another opinion. Shehi ha'isha ha'yafa hi me'od shemimenu ta'u b'nei ha'elohim. Now, do you remember the story that precedes the flood describes these b'nei ha'elohim? And there's a whole conversation. Are they humans? Are they angels? But whatever they are, they see the daughters of man and abuse them, kidnap them, have children, whatever it is that they do with these children, with these women. And according to Ubineha Elohim, they sinned. They sinned with these one, they put that one. Now, the first opinion that Ramban is bringing here is that who is the woman? that caused them to sin? Nama. Nama. The, wait a minute, it gets better, wait. Vihi hanir mezet pasuk, And that hint is in the pasuk, what it says, vayu b'nei Elohim et b'nota adam. It says in the pasuk that these b'nei ha'elohim saw the daughters of man. Kamoshen uskar b'perek rebi elezer. Va'acherim amru, and some others take it a step further. Ki hi ha'ita eshet shamdon aim Ashmedai. This Nama is the wife of somebody called Shamdon, who is the mother of Ashmedai. Who is Ashmedai, king of the demons? Of ultimately, right, any of any of the what we call the bad guys, Umimena Noldu Hashedim. And she is the mother of all that is evil in the world. Now, let me just show you that where he gets this from. If you look here in the last source, which is source 2023, which is the Zohar, again, the title got kicked up. I'll have to send it as a PDF next time. Um, but here, Rabbi Bo said, she was the mother of demons. She bore them. For look, the mother of Ashmedai, king of demons, is named 
Nama. Now, I hope you all appreciate the irony of naming the mother of demons pleasant. Okay, but just I want you to sh show you how prevalent this idea is. Look back at the Rabbeinu Bachya. Rabbeinu Bachya in source 22, after saying that this is the wife of Noah, he then comes along and says, there is a different tradition which claims that Nama was the wife of the demon Ashmedai, if the, the demons Ashmedai and others were born by her. Now, he tells you, we have a tradition that four women became the mothers of demons. Now, some of these names you might recognize, the first being Lilith. She is the most famous of Jewish demons. Naama, Igrat, and Machalat. And each one of them disposes of whole camps of followers and a spiritually negative aura emanates from all of them. And he said that each one of these is dominant. See, he's describing to you all about how demons work. Uh, each one of them is dominant during one of the seasons of the year and they gather at a certain mountain and this mountain is located at a certain place and each one holds sway during one of the seasons, etc. And they are most dangerous and you all know this, you probably have to be. When a demon is most dangerous? At night. At night, so you know this. From sundown until midnight. They and all their members of the respective camps. Now Solomon, you all know how many of you, I have a book at home like this called Solomon and the Demons. And Ashmedai, they're great stories. Oh, it isn't so, maybe. Um, I'll, so if, if you Google it, you'll find lots of stories. So here it says that Solomon was able to control the demons and they became his servants and maids. And what he referred to that he had made the demons subservient to him. These four women were enumerated, were also parallel to the four wives of Asa. Well, we're we'll talking about also the spiritual counterpart of Asav in the celestial regions. Asav on earth also married four wives. Our sages, speak to the third paragraph, our sages in Breshit Rabbah elaborate on the subject when they said that during the 130 years after the death of Hevel, when Adam did not cohabitate with his wife, he produced all kinds of demons and destructive agents as a result of seminal emissions. And it is one of the advantages of the superior being called man because he could beget intangible offsprings, forces which inhabit the atmosphere. He also produced abstract intellectual beings which inhabited the celestial spheres. Do I understand this? No, not at all, not at all, not at all. But what is crazy, but what is fascinating, okay? What is fascinating here, and this is why I bring it, is first of all, the Ramban brings it, Rabbi Nubachia brings it, the Zohar brings it, some of the uh, Kabbalists in the medieval ages brought it, Rabbi Yom Tov Lifman Heller, the Shla, the Shach, a whole bunch of people talk about demons. Demons, though you all understand, are a code word for the Yetzer Hara. And in the medieval ages, I think they used to like scare people into behaving. You want to keep demons out of your house? Put a mezuzah on your door. Like there are all kinds of things like this where like you want to like scare people into keeping mitzvot uh, by, you know, do mitzvot because if you don't do them then, the demons are going to get you. Now. <laughs> yes, okay. And by the way, this became a mutual discussion. Remember the Christian church accused Jews of being demons and the Jews accused the Christians of being demons, right? This was, you know, you, you, you know, people got sick because of demons. It was a whole, you know, they didn't know what germs, they didn't, life was very different. They used to make all kinds of also cameo, you know, against demons. And I need to even tell you that I had a grandmother. I had a grandmother who used to make some sort of garlic potion that you put under the baby's crib mm -hmm. to scare away the demons. Uh, like idolatry. My, it, uh, my father, and that's why I don't know how to do it because this was my father's mother and my father kept saying it was idol worship and therefore it died. My father said it was idol worship and therefore it went to the grave. It went to grave with my mother. Okay, could have been useful. Okay, so now. The red ribbon is part of that square of the eye and Hara is part of that same concept. Now, we have presented here today, based on one pasuk, 
Va'achot Tu Valkayan Naama. And we have talked an hour about this mysterious personality. And we've seen two different he showed to who this woman is. Now, a very simple way of saying is that they are really just two different women with the same name, and that becomes a very easy solution. The alternative, though, and I think this is perhaps a message that we, whether it's the demons, not demons, whatever it is, but essentially we all know how, you know, that you really can't have good unless there's evil. And these men who are being wiped out, when you talk about Yetzer Hara, you still need that Yetzer because that's what is bringing about the development of the world. Music, instruments, metalwork, whatever it is. So that you do need that as well. And that becomes, I think, perhaps she becomes the perfect example about the complexity of human nature. And I think that's true about women in general. You know, are they viewed as good or bad? Is every human being that way as well? And I think here yeah, the idea of saying is Nama, we could view her as a tzaddiket and as being worthy of being saved, but at the same time, we can also view her as the root of evil. evil. And uh, the choice, I guess, they becomes like what? They like making a uh, sort of evil. Uh, here, I'm going to throw something out a new idea. I also discovered when I was preparing this is that the, you, the, the demons come at night, right? And they specifically attack men more, and they specifically attack men in their sleep. Good. <laughs> now, you all know that there's a well-established custom among Ashkenazi. Now, by the way, we're saying about demons. I don't know enough about Sephardic Jewry, but the demons were very present in Ashkenaz. Now, in Ashkenaz, you know, they used to grow the boys here till they were three. So today, people say that it has to be, it has to be about Arla and three years. But I found a source that says that they were growing their hair to confuse the demons, wow. that they should think that it's a girl and leave her, leave the baby alone and go after the, which is fascinating. <laughs> Just get washed away. They, when you stop, when you st yeah, they also have super sisters too. I'm saying, that's their job. <laughs> yes. No. Nama is never mentioned by name as the wife of Noah. It is all the tradition because of the law of conservation of personalities. There is another woman named Nama. I should mention that. We do meet another woman named Nama, who is the wife of Shlom, who is the wife of Shlomo Hamela, who is the mother of Rechavim. Naamaha Amonit is her name. So, and we do have Nomi in Milat Rut. So, <laughs> no, the general, the timing is too long. So I hope that this has presented a new idea. Next, next week, we talk, so I'm giving you the homework so you can listen. Next week, we talk about Haran. Haran. Because let me also just, correct. Again. Unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, many of the mysterious personalities are women. And I don't want this course to become biblical women. So I am looking for mysterious men as well. And we're going to be talking next week about Haran, the father of Lot, the brother of Avram. So as you're reading Parsha this week, see what you can take out from the Pshat. See what you can find out about the Pshat. No, well, it's the end of Noah, right? It is the end of Noah. And a car in the place. Sometimes I have to take certain liberties. Yes, yes. So that's right. So, but that's why I think Hazal want to say that Nama means she had to have been a good person and she had to have been the wife of Noah. Exactly for that reason. Yes.
Last year, I only broke first, but six people. 